Phase Zero bonus episode number nine starts right now. I'm your host, Brandon Davis, and I am joined today by Aaron Perrine. What's Aaron, going on, everybody? Oh, very special episode. I'm excited. I know you are, Aaron, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we also have Jenna Anderson in the virtual building. Hey, everybody. I'm also very excited to be here. <laughs> I wish we had like a, we could add like WandaVision crowd noise for <laughs> each time great. we all come into this. Um, for this, this, this is a special occasion which called for this bonus episode. Uh, it's us having the chance to talk with a Marvel legend, uh, the property master on several of your favorite MCU titles. He created such items as Captain America's shield, Thor's hammer, Ant-Man's Pym particles, the arc reactor in Iron Man from 2008, WandaVision's Darkhold, so much more. We're going to talk about a lot of it. We can't cover all of it. We'd be here for the next three years, just still trying to cover it all. But joining us now on Phase Zero, I'm very excited to welcome to the show, Mr. Russell Bobbitt. Hey, 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 I also am excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm looking at that background already. I see a cap shield. I see a Thor hammer. I see a production schedule full of spoilers. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so everybody, if you want to find Russell, he, he shares a lot of cool stuff on social media. Uh, a lot of the props he's worked on on Instagram and Twitter. It's at Marvel Props on both platforms. So I suggest going to check that out if you want to see some cool behind the scenes stuff. Uh, and just some some of Russell's really awesome work. Uh, we're going to start out because th th we connected because uh, Trillet Studios reached out and you were uh, you were at their gala recently, and that was a big charity event. It was the Real People Cares Gala, uh, and you got to bring out a lot of the the props and stuff. Uh, how often do you get to to take those props out in the wild and show them show them kind of publicly like that? Well, not very often, but uh, what I have done uh, is I've connected with the Board of Education wherever I go. And I take the shield and the hammer to special needs classes. And uh, we see smiles on kids' faces who are almost incapable of smiling. And so for that reason, Marvel has allowed me, given me permission to photograph the shield and the hammer uh, most everywhere I go because, uh, you know, someone will tap me on the shoulder if I'm there and I have it. And they're like, this is a special moment. May I take a picture? <laughs> and so... Uh, so we grant that. So they've, they've given me permission to do the shield and the hammer. And so for that reason, uh, I go out a lot. I go out a lot with those two items. And then uh, at the gala, uh, we snuck in a few little, uh, a few more items, the ones that have already been established in our feature films and uh, yeah. knew that, that they'd be okay. And uh, it was a big event and uh, it went over really well. And uh, a lot of people um, were very excited to take photographs with the stuff. That's cool. That's cool. Which hammer do you take around the heavy one or the light one? Well, I take the light one. Uh, the one behind me, uh, no lie, is about 60 pounds uh, of wow. solid um, metal. You know what kind of metal it is if you're a fan. Uh, and it's really difficult to lift up. Uh, however, the specimen, Chris Hemsworth, um, can pick that up with one hand and wield it over his head like it's nothing. Nice. That's impressive. So kind of going off of that, on the gala night, which prop were you noticing people were most excited to see? Uh, it's the shield. The cap shield uh, and the Thor hammer are very, very popular. But uh, we had um, we had a couple of props from Wakanda there, and th those are very popular as well. Um, and uh, arc reactors are always, you know, they warm people's hearts as they should. Literally. <laughs> literally. Yeah, literally. Um, so asking, uh, how do you get everything made? You know, Trilla Studios right down there in Atlanta where they shoot a lot of this stuff. Do you have to outsource materials? Do, does Kevin Feige just drop all of them off himself in a helicopter and leave them for you guys? How does the magic happen down there in Georgia? Yeah, well, Kevin's not, not very busy most of the time with uh, creating some of the greatest content in the whole wide world. So he just um, goes shopping for materials for me. Um, not really. <laughs> But uh, no, we, we uh, you know, we're challenged with a very short time period relatively to prepare all this stuff. So I'll get a script and, uh, and read it quickly, uh, immediately go to the drawing board when I see we need an arc reactor or whatever it is. Uh, and we draw five or six versions. We take it to the director. The director says, yes, we love it. We then have a big group you know, meeting. Uh, we call them viz dev meetings where we show the trio, Kevin, Lou, Victoria, uh, all the props, and they weigh in. 
Uh, so it's quite the process to even get to a place where a Thor hammer is what a Thor hammer should be. Uh, at that point, uh, I'll then get the actor involved uh, and start prototyping props so that we figure out the scale, right? How big should a Thor hammer be? How heavy can the, the cap shield be? What can I make it out of? And so I then take just my manufacturing experience um, and engineering and design and go at it hardcore. You asked me if there's a vendor. There are several vendors, and then there are not enough vendors. So in that short period of time, it's really challenging to, to pull together uh, up, you know, upwards of a thousand props per film uh, or streaming project uh, to, you know, and we, we just go for it. And so it's challenging. Uh, so I, I keep every vendor that is movie savvy uh, under my belt and keep them all very busy year round. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're all going to go around kind of just like how we just did with uh, with some questions. I'm kicking us off with like our MCU experience questions. I want to go back to Iron Man. Uh, you were a part of the film that started it all. You were at the heart of the heart that started it all. And I saw I saw you were talking about one time how um, you had to design the arc reactor so that Downey as Tony Stark could actually interact with it and like solder it himself. Uh, I, I would love to hear. Do you remember like what went into those mo like that creation and like to down did you have to teach Downey kind of prop lessons and stuff early on? Yeah, sure. Uh, do I remember? Yes, I do. It kind of changed my life a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can even start further back. I got a phone call. We did the movie Zathura, uh, with, and I did it with Luis D. Esposito and uh, Michael Riva, the production designer, suggested that I do Iron Man, and and Luis called me and. I went to this small office in Beverly Hills over a Mercedes dealership where Marvel was. And uh, I sit down and there's a desk, a phone, and a whiteboard in the office. And Lou says to me, hey, you want to work on this film with us. It's about a guy in a metal suit and he saves the world. He's great. He's like a millionaire play playboy. And, uh, and I was, you know, not knowing much about Iron Man uh, because at that point I wasn't a huge uh, comic book person as a child, you know, as many people are, uh, I, I thought to myself, oh, sure, Lou, wh whatever you say, we'll, we'll work on a movie about a guy in a metal suit any day, because I like working with Lou. Uh, so uh, he gets a phone call, picks up the phone, and I'm just, you know, sitting in the office with a desk and a phone and a whiteboard, and I look over at the whiteboard, and it says Iron Man 1, Iron Man 2. Captain America 1, Captain America 2, Thor 1, Thor 2, and so on. And it was about 10, 10 projects. And I looked, and I'm thinking, and all I had to do was look at that whiteboard and wait for this phone call to be over. And I thought, boy, that's ambitious. You know, we're, we're jumping in to make this movie about the guy in the metal suit. And they've got like 10 of them lined up. And uh, that was, what was that, 15, 18 years ago? Not only have they made those 10 movies, but they've made you know, how many more since and how many projects we've all been. So that was kind of the beginning of it. When we went to shoot and we were, I believe that was one of our first scenes, uh, I, you know, with John Favreau, Robert Downey Jr. We were in the cave and uh, it was an amazing set uh, uh, over at Sony Studios. And uh, uh, they wanted they wanted it to seem cold and, and they wanted Robert's breath to show, you know. So they refrigerated the stage down to 32 degrees. We were all in there with parkas. No one knew what we were going to do yet. I, I, we had designed all these missiles and parts to missiles and so on and so forth. And so when, when it came time to put together the first arc reactor, I basically went into my shop and grabbed everything I could find. Uh, you know, silly little clamps and, and magnifying glasses and alligator clips and anything I could find to hold wires and, and you know, so on. We obviously planned out the arc reactor uh, based on a design that he would build. And so I, we created the, the sand cast mold for the palladium to be poured into. And then he would pour it, you know, pour it into the ring and, and we did have a moment where he soldered. So in all those cases, and, and many cases beyond that, we have um, worked with, I'm not going to say I taught Robert, but we worked with Robert and trained him to, um, to solder. 
and to weld and to hammer molten metal and as you know as you saw in that in that cave scene and none of us were really sure about how that was all going to come out until we were done shooting it and uh one of the a cool moment that i had with john favreau is he came up to me and he gave me an attaboy and patted me on the shoulder and he went to shake my hand and i as i as we our hands parted he had left a single wrapped lifesaver in my hand and uh, it was his message to me saying, thanks for making a good scene. Uh, and, wow. and it was the beginning of many, many scenes to come. And, and we just formed this collaborative, really cool process of uh, figuring out props. That's cool. Wow. I mean, I don't think there's anything that's going to be as intense as that. But is there another prop that we needed to have, like, thought out so that the actor could interact with it physically, like Loki's staff in the Avengers or getting Chris, Chris Evans to like know how to hold the shield and like reflect it so that it doesn't get broken or like it doesn't look weird on camera. Yes. And so let me say this too. I do all the, the projects in the States and I have a counterpart in London. So let's give some credit to the London folks for doing the first Captain America. And uh, we, we did the first, Thor. So we were part of, you know, the Thor hammer. The, the cap shield was originally uh, designed by Barry Gibbs in London, did a great job. And we've all, we sort of share technology and we, we you know, we pass the torch. Uh, what, where, where the shield is a big challenge is this. There are four different kinds of shields. There's a metal shield. Uh, there is a hard fiberglass shield there's a hard rubber shield and there's a soft rubber shield. So we've all developed this process of figuring out what kind of shields we need. So the challenge there was uh, our metal shield weighed 14 pounds uh, for the first few movies. Uh, we had a fiberglass shield that would be the one that was always on his back if he was riding the motorcycle. And then he would pretend to throw it and CG picks it up and throws a shield at 100 miles an hour. A hard rubber shield is when he gets punched. If anybody punches the shield, they're, they're hitting rubber so they don't break their hand. The soft rubber shield is when you're doing a somersault. If you're jumping off something and you're rolling, uh, it's gotta be a soft rubber shield, otherwise it, you, you can get hurt on that. So recently, and I think it was, oh, maybe Civil War, uh, Chris came to me, Chris Evans, there's so many Chris's. <laughs> Chris Evans came to me and said, dude, this is way too heavy. It's 14 pounds. I can't carry it all the time. Give me the rubber one. And so it's hard for me. The rubber one, you can't get a great uh, paint job on. It doesn't never looks like the metal one. And so my goal was to reduce the weight of that metal shield so that he would primarily carry the metal shield. It catches light. It looks, it looks like uh, vibranium. And it, you know, it's just you can't beat it. So I figured out a new way to redesign the shield um, and cut off about seven pounds. And so we went from 14 to seven pounds. He was so stoked on it that he was like, give me the real shield all the time. <laughs> now, good and bad for me. Uh, I make about 30 shields per movie. The life expectancy of a shield is about three scenes before it's damaged beyond repair. And I'm not going to talk about how much these shields cost because it's ridiculous. And uh, we'll just keep that a trade secret. But they're a lot of money. Let me get a broken shield, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> broken shield. You know, the, the moral of that story is there's about 150, 180 shields floating around uh, wow. that, that stay in a, in a super secret warehouse in uh, California. Uh, our Marvel, Marvel warehouse is 100. 100,000 square feet, and we've got wow. a couple of them. Uh, but so that that's another one of the really challenging props that has um, sort of, you know, uh, morphed into, you know, many different versions and many different movies and films and streamers now. And so it, it's been really cool, and, and we're all very proud of, uh, of that shield. And, and yeah. when I put that shield in, some, in, in anybody's hands, uh, the, the ironic part of it is they immediately take the pose of saving the world. 
nobody ever just like looks at it and smiles and they giggle and they take a picture. They immediately become uh, Captain America when they hold that shield. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. That is amazing. So speaking of another Chris that is in the Marvel Universe, um, one of the most iconic props is the Guardians cassette tape and the cassette player itself. How did you design that and what did you want it to say about Peter Quill as you were designing it? Yeah, well, the awesome thing about that is that I didn't have to design it. The 80s, the <laughs> 80s designed it. Uh, and it, it's really cool because, you know, James Gunn really likes um, icons of, of pop culture. And, uh, and that's like the ultimate icon, right? Uh, where there was a challenge is after Guardians 1, the eBay community made that, um, that very popular, the, uh, the Walkman and the headsets. Uh, and so that's all good and that's fine. And we're creating, you know, pop culture on top of pop culture. That's cool. But when movie two came around, I needed more of them and they were really hard to find. So, because everybody had bought them. And so, um, all right, well, we had a few from the first movie and uh, where we had an issue was the headsets. You know, the orange headsets, the little foam orange headset is, um, was hard to find. I called Sony and said, hey, I'm Russell Bobbitt and I need more headsets. And they said, we don't care who you are. We had a warehouse burned down and they are all gone. There are no more headsets. So I went on eBay like a good prop guy would and I found three headsets that they were asking about $6,000 for. And uh, I, I couldn't stomach it. I, I was like, forget it. I'm gonna manufacture myself. I literally remanufactured Sony's headset verbatim to the T with the graphics and the foam. I had to custom manufacture the orange foam. Uh, we made 12 of them. Uh, again, I won't share how much money, but it was competitive with the eBay versions where I would have had three of them. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. It's super That's crazy. And we run into that kind of stuff all the time. If something doesn't exist or I can't buy it in the store, I just make it. That's, that's just who we've become, you know? Yeah. Wow. Um, that's that's unbelievable. Uh, oh, and you go from um, Earth-based characters, like how this kind of franchise mostly started with the exception of Thor, but then Thor also was largely set on Earth. Guardians is fully cosmic. So I imagine that's a big jump. But I want to know, is it harder to go from Earth to cosmic or from present day earth to like the forties, the sixties and create that world? Yeah, great question. And I talk about this a lot. And here's the great, a great way to look at that. In the forties, fifties, in any time period that we know on earth, there are rules. If we're doing a movie in the forties, there's only stuff that went on in the forties that I have to find or remanufacture or, you know, and, and there is a set of rules. A pencil looks like a pencil in the 40s. Uh, you know, there may have been different colors, and I'll provide all that. But in outer space, there are no rules. It's completely imagination. And so uh, the challenge is to convey to an audience that this is a weapon, or this is a vessel that you drink fluid out of, or, you know, whatnot. And so the, the real challenge is, to, is to, to pick and choose your designs where it immediately is recognized and people know, oh, that's a cup of coffee. But then they look at it closer and they take it frame by frame and go, holy cow, that's a really cool outer space coffee mug. You know, so that's, it's more challenging to be in outer space for sure. Uh, you know, and listen, we have human beings acting in these roles. So they have to wear uh, blouses, pants, shirts, you know, they, they're all based in a human body. So it's very challenging. Yeah. 
So kind of so, going off of that, over the years, Marvel has seen that audiences are really starting to kind of trust them and accept the more wilder ideas or concepts or characters. How have you seen that on the prop side? Where do you think you've kind of gotten the best opportunity to introduce a really creative and weird prop that the audience might not have, like, might not have embraced in the first Iron Man movie or the first Captain America movie? Yeah, it's really tricky that, um, and, and it's probably why I'm still around after, you know, that whiteboard was finished, plus two more of them. Uh, but we've created a vernacular in the MCU, and, and we treat it, I treat it anyway, like an old-fashioned soap opera, where you know these characters from the beginning till the end, and you follow these characters, and these characters all have been established, and they have personality, and if all of a sudden from Iron Man 1 to, you know, Avengers, Tony Stark's, you know, style changed completely, I think it would throw an audience off. I think they would lose touch with Tony Stark, right? And so we really go out of our way to try to, to keep a consistency uh, throughout the MCU where it's almost unnoticeable. You know, I really want if, if I get through a day and nobody says to me, hey, what about that prop? Is that the right color? If, if, I, if nobody talks to me during the day, I've got the confidence to say I did well that day. Something didn't stick out. It fit. It fit in the MCU. It fit in our vernacular, our, our, the, our palette. Uh, you know, that's my goal is to continuously stay on the Marvel train in the Marvel soap opera of of different events and different characters and different films and different streaming projects. Whew. <laughs> it's a challenge. It really is. And, and it's, it's one that it, it comes to you. And, and if you live in that space, uh, it keeps coming back. You just keep, keep going. Um, so I know uh, we talked about Captain America shield already uh, a, a little bit, but, it has changed over time, the physical, other than your amazing ability to cut down the weight and have it. So you're, you're probably not going to have it again, I guess, for Mac here. Maybe he's already asked you that. Uh, what, were, what was the, um, the motivation behind doing the five notches in the star uh, now, as we saw in Falcon Winter Soldier? Yeah, that, the, that motivation just came from a director. <laughs> he said, let's change it up. Kevin was on board. Uh, Obviously, when when old Captain America hands off the shield, that's when we introduced it, uh, knowing that there would be more to come, as we saw in uh, Winter Falcon Winter Winter Soldier. Um, it it basically was my attitude was, and the way I saw it and interpreted it was, I'm I'm handing off the torch, I'm passing the torch. Um, I've made some improvements. I want you to run with this. It's your shield. It's not mine. Right? Mm -hmm. So that, Now, that's one guy's interpretation. Hopefully, a lot of other people saw it the same way. Uh, but uh, but that, that's kind of, in a nutshell, where we went with it. One of, one of my favorite things that I've ever um, gotten to see in person is the gauntlet. I was on the set of uh, Infinity War. And they told me all day, there's no gauntlet, there's no gauntlet. And I was like, there has to be a gauntlet. Let me see this thing. And then you came rolling it out like it was in like a infinity gauntlet version of a guitar case. It was the coolest thing I ever saw. Um, like, how often did the gauntlet get used in the movie at all? Like the practical version? Because they made the small one for Brolin, which was really just for Brolin. But this big one that was fully formed and had the lights and everything. How often did you use that? We use that every single take that the gauntlet is involved with in that we do a lighting reference. We take mm -hmm. it out, we turn on the lights, we spin it around all for the post-production folks who uh, have to model it and rebuild it. So in every environment, we pulled out the 35 pound Thanos size made of brass and copper by a blacksmith, Tony Swatton. Uh, in Glendale now, I think. Um, every single take of every single shot. 
that comes out, we do a reference. So we did. We built two of those. Uh, don't know where they are in the world now, but they go out on tour all the time for people to see. We're very proud of them. They also house, as you know, all the Infinity Stones. Um, and then, yes, Brolin really, for his character, wanted to, to be able to interact. And so we made a miniature version for him that he wore most of the day, like he really didn't care to take it off. Once he had it on, even in between takes, when he went to the restroom, when he went to the craft service table, whatever it was, uh, he would he would keep that on most of the day. <laughs> Dude, so does that mean that like Thanos' uh, kind of helicopter blade sword weapon also existed for lighting reference? Did you all actually create that? That is correct. So we, we designed it all uh, on paper. Uh, we build, uh, you know, the, the, the post-production world still allows us the um, creativity, the, the creative design elements. They don't want to take that over ever. And so they, they have the, us, the artists, create the first model for everything. And, uh, and we use that. We scan it, by the way. So I make it the proper scale, the right size and the right weight and the right uh, finishes. Uh, and if there are lights in it, I put the lights in it, um, that they use to scan. And we do all our lighting reference the same way I described about the, uh, the Infinity Gauntlet. And so that, uh, I yeah. want to know how that, that blade was described to you. Like, is this like a cosmic metal, like an earthbound metal? Because that's something that we, I don't know if we've heard about. Yeah, no, uh, you know, it, it wasn't so much about who made it. It's about what's going to look good on this gigantic character, right? And so really the draw at the drawing board, we, we played with that. We played with gigantic hammers and, and axes. And, you know, there was many, many iterations of it uh, until we finally came to a place of um, that blade. And, uh, and originally that blade was just a single blade with a handle at the end. And... Uh, and I always like to take it to the next level as, you know, you give a director five choices uh, and if they pick one that they like, you're in good shape, right? So one of my choices was to do a double handle. That's, that's cool. uh, yeah. And, that's great. and you know, it's very, I, I have a similar story about Star Trek and the, and the phasers that we made with J.J. Abrams. Uh, but I, I take it to that next level and that's the one that, that made it for Thanos. Good work, good, sir. sir. That's awesome. So WandaVision introduced the Darkhold and some of the other props that are now going to appear in Doctor Strange 2. Did you collaborate at all with Sam Raimi and the team of that movie while you were working on WandaVision and on Loki? 100%. 100%. The Darkhold book came from them because how we weigh that out is uh, what, where is there more screen time for the prop, right? And, and story-wise, um, it was going to have... Um, a bigger say so than than ours did in in our show. So we, yes, we did collaborate. We made those together. In fact, they made it for me, sent it to me. I used it and got it back to them. Uh, Is it, I've been down to uh, Trillith. I was on the set of Suicide Squad while they were filming Falcon and Winter Soldier and Wandavision right next to each other. Is it getting, is it again a little crazy with so many projects filming at the same time, or is it a little bit more convenient because you guys have uh, like eighteen stages down there, Trillith, to just ride a golf cart from one to the next? I have grown accustomed to four hours of sleep. <laughs> Same, actually. Yeah, <laughs> but, no, it's, but yeah. it's super crazy. Um, I, I have put together a ton of really incredible, talented teams of people to help me pull all this off. Um, you know, Marvel's uh, priority with the streaming shows is that I put my touch on it design-wise uh, to, to maintain everything we talked about, you know, with the MCU and the, the continuity of it. Uh, and I bring on a lot of uh, uh, several teams of people to help me uh, pull off all this that we need to pull off. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of teams, not just a team. <laughs> it takes a lot of teams. And so that's how we've been handling it. Aaron, this is oh, it's me? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so with Spider-Man No Way Home, 
uh, you got to deal with a lot of stuff from the past. There's a lot of stuff that you guys might not have had in these in these warehouses that exist that now I'm imagining the Ark of the Covenant sitting next <laughs> to Cat when I Cap Shields. Uh, did you have any help or did you approach work with Sony to recreate the suits or the web shooters or pumpkin bombs or anything like that for No Way Home? We did. We maintained the look of the pumpkin bombs and I rebuilt them. Uh, because when they, you know, when they sit on a shelf for that many years, the, you know, wiring corrodes and all that good stuff. So, yes, we did. Um, you know, uh, we also created a whole lot of new stuff for it as well. But, um, but we did. We pulled some web shooters out of the old archives, and uh, you know, Sony um, has a policy where they will loan you the prop, uh, but you are not to alter it in any way, and so. So in some cases, there was only one of something. So I had to recreate so that we got our multiples, right? A rubber version and a real version and a lighted version and so on and so forth. So uh, so we definitely, you know, scraped and borrowed and whatnot uh, as best we could. And then we had to recreate other stuff. And, and to like, uh, you know, Jamie Foxx's costume, uh, I was it was an integral part of the prop department. Um, you know, we created because he had arc reactors on his suit and we we sort of created the apparatus that went on top of the costume, um, which a, a lot of people won't know because it seemed like it was all costume. But uh, we we collaborated and, and really were a big part of that costume. And we were really proud of that one. That is That's so, so cool. cool. Yeah. So um, you're working on a few of the upcoming shows like Miss Marvel and She-Hulk, obviously without getting into any specifics of spoilers. Have you gotten to take a crack at anything new and unique there from a creative standpoint? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can give you. It's really exciting stuff. Um, it's uh, There's a lot of cool uh surprises, some cameos, you know, all the stuff that you would expect uh, out of a, a, a project like like those. You know, uh, when we did Marvel, uh, WandaVision, uh, I read that one. I was like, wow, is this, is this really a Marvel script? <laughs> I'm like, what am I reading here? And then all of a sudden it, it morphed into a super crazy Marvel, you know, story. And so you get a little of that out of the upcoming stuff as well. And, and a lot of good surprises and I'm not going to share any of it. <laughs> that was good. That was a good, safe, uh, safe yeah. way to dodge that bullet. So I'm going to end it with this then uh, like just characters or props, um, whether you've already worked on them or just you're as a Marvel fan yourself, as I'm sure you've grown to be, if you weren't already, like, is there anything that you're really excited for fans to see or just one day, you know, this is a character, this is a prop that you hope to get to bring to life? Well, you know, I, I'm often asked, what is my favorite prop? And, uh, and my answer is this, my favorite prop is the prop I'm working on today. I, I treat them like my children. Uh, I, I, I conceive them on paper. I raise them into the manufacturing world. Uh, I, we, we put our finishing touches on them and then we release them into the world and they either do really well on their own or they don't. But at that point, I've, I've let them go. They're off to college. They're, they're doing their thing. They're living in the universe. And then I'm off to my next favorite prop. So I'm really excited uh, when, when a director looks at a prop on a set and he says, bring that camera over here and shoot a close up on that prop. I know I've done my job. You know, I've, I've done a good job if they do that. If something looks cool and it's really great, they'll shoot it. And if it's just okay, well, maybe it's in the background. So what I'm excited to share with people out there uh, with our upcoming stuff that I can't talk about is, you know, some of these, these babies of mine that, that we've created and, you know, this cool stuff that I go home with every day, you know, and I just, that's as far as it goes until it shows up on the big screen or on now your computer or your TV. Uh, so or at yeah. Marvel props on Instagram and Twitter, by the way, everybody reminder, you can get a look at those at Marvel props. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, like, there's story, there's great stuff. Like, let me just leave you with one. Uh, we were doing Thor one and Kevin Feige came up to me and said, 
hey man, just can you make us a gauntlet? It's it's it should be metal. Do it out of copper. Put some stones in it, and it's just going to be in the background. It's a little teaser. And I was like in the thick of it, right? I'm like, do I'm designing Thor pro Odin's spear and you know like Thor's hammer for the first time and trying to figure out what Asgard even meant. And uh, so uh, I was like, sure, Kevin, I'll, yeah, sure. How long do I have? A couple of weeks? Okay, sure, we'll do that. <laughs> and so <laughs> we banged it out, we did it, we made our first gauntlet. I never knew that the gauntlet was gonna have its own movie. And I learned that, <laughs> I learned that day that anything they asked me to do could be a character in a film it could be a you know a huge prop, whatever it is. It eventually is going to come back, it, you know, multiplied in importance. And so everything I do, I treat like it's the biggest thing in the world, you know. And and sometimes they look at me and say, "Why are you spending so much money on a prop?" And my answer could be, "Well, because that's what it should be. It has to be that, because this this prop could have its own movie." you know, called Endgame. <laughs> Thor true. Thor with a gauntlet, you know, like That's a... Kevin didn't tell me that day that this movie was going to happen, you know, five years from then. Uh, and, and it was going to be, you know, the biggest movie ever. He didn't tell me that. He just said, make a gauntlet. Anyway, that, that's kind of the attitude we take. And uh, it's been my career for, you know, 20 years with Marvel and 20 years prior to that on a bunch of other really great, projects uh and i think that's why i'm still here <laughs> i think you're doing great work so i think the whole team at marvel studios you guys are you guys are full of very talented people and you are uh, you are among the best of them over there so russell it's a, it's it's an absolute pleasure an absolute treat to have you on our phase zero show i can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us also i want to thank trillet studios for setting this up and for the awesome work that they do down there in georgia and uh yeah, that, everybody go follow uh, at Marvel Props on Twitter and Instagram. And I feel like that's a good ending point. Russell, I'll let you have the last words if you want to send us out. Hey, you know, thanks for having me. It was really good to meet you all. Uh, this kind of stuff lights me up, and I love sharing as much as I can share. So thanks for having me. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you, everybody. That's bonus episode number nine. See you soon.